5.30 on the nose. Uh, so I will call this meeting to order. And Holly, could you uh, call the roll? President Henry? Here. Director Ferris? Here. Director Falls? Here. Director Moran? Present. So that was everyone. Uh, and welcome everyone. Um, Rick Rogers, are there any changes, additions, deletions to the agenda? Sure, Henry, I'd like to request that we change the order of the agenda tonight and take uh, new business item 3A first out of order, the review of the draft fiscal year 2019-20 comprehensive annual finance report. Due to the fact that we have uh, the auditor, um, Andy Beck, uh, here with us to give a uh, board presentation. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to open it up now for public comment. And because we do have uh, the audit, and I don't, there aren't very many, well, there are more attendees now all of a sudden. Um, I'm going to ask that you only talk for three minutes. Holly will um, be the timer, I assume. She was last time. And all of you that are members of the public, I'm going to give you three minutes. Um, you may talk about anything that's not on the agenda at this time. And I just want to remind everybody that when you're talking about, let's say right now, if you talk, you only get to talk one time. Now, when it comes to the audit, I'm assuming that you probably can ask questions during the audit, if you raise your hand. Um, but then when we get to the final item, you only get to talk one time on that particular item. And again, it's gonna be three minutes. So uh, with that said, um, I will turn this over to Rick Rogers. And with that, uh, Chair Henry, I'll ask our finance uh, manager to present the uh, draft annual financial report. Thank you. Again, my name is Andy Begg with the firm of EDAC and Brown. And I like to start with the independent auditor's report, which is located on page 10 of the financial statement. On the bottom paragraph, we give an opinion. In the case of the district, we give an unmodified opinion by saying that the financial statements are fairly presented. Financial highlights on the statements of net position Total assets and deferred outflows of resources increased by approximately $18.1 million. Total liabilities and deferred inflows of resources increased by $15.9 million. And net position increased by approximately $2.2 million to $33.4 million, of which $868,000 is unrestricted and available for future use. I don't mean to interrupt, Andy, but I. I think we have a presentation that you're talking on and it's not up on the screen yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Let me try to do this. Uh, hopefully I can get this. I thought up. CTV had the presentation free already to put up. So we could get the, the presentation put up. Apologies for interrupting. The easiest way is for Andy to share his screen. That way he can move the slide along by himself. But CTV does have the presentation if he's unable to share his screen. So share screen. Perfect. We there see it. We see the opening page. Okay. 
Okay, the independent auditor's report, uh, as I mentioned, this is located on page 10 of the financial statements. In the case of the district, we give an unmodified clean opinion by saying that the financial statements are fairly presented. Financial highlights on the statement of net position, total assets and deferred outflows of resources increased by approximately $18.1 million. Total liabilities and deferred inflows of resources increased by approximately $15.9 million. And net position increased by approximately $2.2 million to $33.4 million, of which $868,000 is unrestricted and available for future use. On the statements of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position, total revenues increased by approximately $1.3 million. Total expenses increased by approximately $1.1 million. Capital contributions decreased by approximately $27,000. And again, increasing net position by approximately $2.2 million. We also provide a management report, which consists of our communication with those charged with governance. In the case of the district, that would be the board of directors and our communication of control deficiencies. In our communication with those charged with governance, we are required to communicate significant estimates and sensitive note disclosures. In the case of the district, cash and investments, capital assets, net pension and OPEB liability were all significant estimates and sensitive note disclosures. There were no difficulties encountered in performing the audit. There were no disagreements with management and there were no management consultation with other independent accountants. In our communication of control deficiencies, we noted no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. Uh, I would like to conclude by thanking Mr. Rick Rogers and Ms. Stephanie Hill for their assistance in our test work. Uh, questions? Anybody have questions? Uh, I, I don't hear any questions from the board. Uh, should I go to the public and see if they have questions? Chair Henry, I see that uh, Director Ferris's hand uh, did go up. Oh, no, not anymore. Okay, uh, I do see his hand up, yes. Okay. Lou, you have a question? I do. Andy, I did not see in the report anywhere a statement of what our reserves were at the end of the fiscal year, June 30th. Do you, do you, can you inform, uh, enlighten me on that? When you talk about reserves, are you talking about the, I guess the unrestricted net position? I'm not a financial person, so I can't answer that question. Okay, well, let me take a look into your, one of your notes in your financial statements. That Stephanie, might, if you're that on might, the call, that, maybe you can help. That might be better directed at Stephanie. That's what I did. I just asked Stephanie if she's on the call, if she could please help. I am. So, right. So our reserves versus what the unrestricted net position is going to be a little bit different because it's taking all of, it's taking the changes in all of your assets and all of your liabilities. So, for example, we have on our liabilities compensated employee absences. Part of our reserve fund policy is that we earmark a third of our uh, liability for that to go towards that. But from this perspective, that full balance is going to be going against our assets. So it's not an apples to apples for 
um, what the reserves are for what we do through the budget process. So what's gonna happen is now that we have the final audit numbers, the next budget and finance committee meeting we'll be bridging the gap between how the audit differs from our budget. And so the next budget and finance will have the full year view compared to the audit. And it'll help pull out some of those, you know, non-cash items um, and different things like that so that you can see what our true ending cash reserves were at the end of the fiscal year. So you're saying I was wrong in assuming that there would be a reserve statement in the final audited financial report. Correct. The reserve, the reserve, our reserve fund policy operates differently than what a financial audit report is going to have. Okay. Thank you. So are there any uh, more questions from the board? I don't see any pause. Um, so I will go to attendees and ask them if they have any questions. Anyone? Um, okay. Laura? Or Laura? Hi. Um, I just um, am new to this, uh, but I just wanted to get, I heard that it was the end of the fiscal year. It was at the end of June. Um, so of course, before all the fires and all the other incidents that have happened since then, just to get clarity. So the fiscal That's year. Correct. Our, I say I'll take it again. So yes, the, our fiscal year runs from July 1st through June 30th. So June 30th, these numbers are all reflecting pre-fire. Um, we do note in, in the document, it does acknowledge the fact that we did have um, the fire that occurred. Um, any financial impact from that will be seen in this, in this current year that we're in right now. So does that answer your question, Laura? Uh, any any other member of the community who wants to say or ask a question? I do not. Wow. I don't see any. Okay. All right. So we'll go back to Andy Beck, I guess. Right? Well, uh, that I'll is probably go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. Sorry. I'm pretty much done with my presentations. Uh, I'm just here to answer any questions. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So I was just going to say from my, from my perspective, you know, the audit went very smoothly. Uh, Fadak and Brown and Andy and his team have always been um, great to work with. Uh, it is great to see the district's unrestricted net position um, being a positive balance and, you know, close to 900,000. Uh, the prior couple years, we were running at a deficit. There are different reasons for why we were. It was a lot of it was due to the district uh, using cash to fund a lot of large capital projects versus debt financing. Um, so that that was really good to see that we're moving in a positive direction there. Um, the back of the audit does have a statistical section that does lay out a lot of this stuff um, for anyone that likes to look more so at trends. It does do a 10 year trend for a lot of the different stuff. So you could kind of see how the district um, has grown or developed in different areas. I know this is a bit of an intense document to go through. Um, so if people ever have questions about stuff, they can always reach out to me. Uh, the audit is kind of that post-mortem, it's after the fact, look back. Um, so a lot of times it is a little bit more structured. And as you can see, sometimes there really aren't a whole lot of questions around this. Um, coming up is going to be the review comparing how it looked against the budget. And then upcoming is going to be when we go back into budget season, which is where we tend to dive into stuff a lot more deeper. Um, but overall, it was a good looking financial year for the district with some, you know, key capital projects like the probation tank um, being completed in this past fiscal year. And Outside of that, um, it is recommended that the Board of Directors uh, approve the, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District financial statements for the fiscal year 2019 to 2020. 
Anybody want to make a motion to uh, approve the audit or? Excuse me, Lois, I have my hand up. Okay. I, I had no questions. I wanted to make sure everybody else had an opportunity to ask questions. I have no questions, but I do have uh, comments. And I will go through these as rapidly as possible. Um, I am very comfortable with the fact that the audit as presented um, is accurate for what it is covering. And I certainly will be voting for it here shortly. Um, but I also wanna make sure that the community understands that there is a gap here between what the audit information provides and the true financial position of the district, particularly uh, with respect to infrastructure and other accrued obligations that are not part of this particular report um, because they're outside the scope of this particular report. Um, and that has to do with a very lengthy list of accrued obligations that this district has accrued over the last uh, few decades and which are going to be um, something that we as a district are going to have to deal with in one form or another. Um, that is um, going to be a very, very uh, lengthy and um, probably painful conversation. And I'm hopeful over the course of this next year, we're actually going to be able to bring some clarity to what all of those particular categories are and how much, um, how many dollars are associated with each one of those categories. Um, you know, for example, the, the one that's come out during this year of our tank maintenance being behind to the tune of about $10 million. So um, there, are, there are several other categories that we're gonna have to deal with that are in that same kind of, uh, of picture. Um, I, and so that's why um, I really wanna encourage folks to understand that while this is a view of our financial health, it is a view from one particular perspective, which is a little bit narrower than what we as a board have to deal with at a strategic level and at a long-term level. Um, I do want to uh, point out a few things in here that I think are uh, interesting. Um, basically, if you look at uh, operating expenses between uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, they went up about 7%. Um, if we continue down that path, our operating expenses will double in 10 years. Rule of thumb, 7% um, increase means a doubling in 10 years. Uh, when it comes to pension liability, uh, the state continues to assume a 7.1% ROI on their investments. And that is simply not borne out by the historical information that provides a balanced view between economic growth and economic recessions. Um, a 5.8% is more in line with their 20 year history. And at 5.8%, our pension liability goes from 4 million, a little over 4 million, but probably closer to 7 million, not quite 2X, but definitely a significant a step up. And if you look at our liability, the numbers are definitely going in the wrong direction over the last few years in terms of our liabilities going up. In terms of risk management on note 10, I'd like to encourage us as a board to uh, take a look at adding cybersecurity risk to the risk management that we have to be concerned about. Cybersecurity risk is a uh, regrettably increasing issue for many, many agencies, public agencies in particular. And even though we're a small agency, we're still going to be impacted by uh, the things that are coming down the pike with respect to managing cybersecurity risk. Um, I, I wanna compliment Stephanie for the um, great information that is in the supplementary section. Um, I think this helps provide some additional um, uh, information, uh, excuse me, not the required supplementary information, the optional supplementary information that she includes. Um, this is a good thing for us to be doing and I'd like to see it expanded. 
I want to point out on page um, 92 of 121, our operating revenues have gone up almost 2.5 times in the last 10 years. That's a bit over 10% compounded annually, um, which is something like three to four percent, uh, three to four times over inflation, depending on the year. But we have not seriously improved our position as a district with respect to the accrued liabilities that this district has uh, on, on, um, on its books, one way or the other. That is not a good trend. Um, that's basically running in place, even at a 10% compounded uh, increase in revenues year over year, which is a, a very healthy increase in revenues, but it's, it's merely keeping us running in place. Um, I, we're gonna have to take a look at that. And finally, on the water usage, one of the things I'd like to see us add to water usage is approximations of what the indoor gallons per day per uh, person we're currently running at, because this is typically something that comes up as a very big discussion item, should we get into a drought year or multiple years? And with La Nina apparently upon us, that is a di distinct possibility. We're currently, for last year, uh, sold uh, about 500 million gallons um, at, uh, but if we look at say um, winter months usage, which is more of the indoor usage that we expect to see um, at the estimates of 19,000 people, we're looking at right around 50 gallons a day, which is ultimately the state goal. But since we have 18,000 registered voters in our district, um, I'm believing the census is gonna show our population is closer to 22,000. And at that level, we're sitting at about 43 gallons per day. Should we get to the point where the state mandates a 20% drop in usage, that would take us, that would require us to go down to 35 gallons a day. In other words, our being well ahead of the state in terms of the goals, might actually not work out to our favor if we get dropped into that category. So at some point, we also need to make sure we're keeping track of that. So with that, that's some of the highlights I wanted to cover. Um, we will, of course, be continuing this conversation in the budget committee and um, other forums as we work very hard to present a very transparent, very clear picture of all of the accrued obligations that we have that are simply not part of this particular report. Thank you. Do any other board members have a comment? And I'm gonna go back to the public and ask them. Okay, any members of the public having comment? Seeing none, I will turn this. Uh, we, we need to make a motion here to accept this audit. So I'm gonna ask again, would someone like to make an, a motion to accept the 2019-2020 audit? Lois. Uh, this is Rick Moran. I'll make the motion to accept the 2020 audit. All right, thank I'll you. Second. About a second. Well, and, and this is District Council, just a point of clarification. Stephanie, did you want approval or acceptance of the audit? I read approval in the board memo. I, I mean, I guess it's accepting approval of the audit. I guess it would just be an acceptance of the report. Okay, thank you. Okay, <laughs> do, do we have a second? Second. I heard one, yes. Lou, did I hear you second it or not? No, it wasn't me, it was Bob, it was me. Oh, it was Bob, okay, all right, okay. President second. Henry? Yes. 
Director Ferris? Aye. Director Falls? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Andy. All right, thank you everyone and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, we'll go back to um, a board member resignation, board of directors, vacancy resolution. Uh, and discussion of any possible action by the board regarding the process to fill the vacancy declared by the board. I, I'm gonna give it to you, Rick, and you can- Okay, uh, thank you, Chair Henry. Uh, for this item, uh, District Council Nichols will present this to the board. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Um, all right, so this is the third time now that um, former director Steve Swans, uh, the issue of filling his now vacant board seat has come before the board. I'm just gonna give a, a quick history um, here. So at the regular meeting conducted on November 5th, the board determined that a vacancy exists uh, on the board because um, former director Swan was no longer residing within the district. Um, at the board meeting on November 10th, the board passed a motion to fill the vacancy by calling for an election and to immediately notify the elections office of this decision. Um, the next day, uh, the district manager notified the county clerk of the board's decision. Um, following that notification, um, the question was posed to me whether a resolution is required. Um, I contacted the county clerk on Monday, this past Monday, November 16th, and the county clerk uh, provided a template for a resolution ordering an election um, that they request in order to move forward with um, actually conducting the election on behalf of the district. Um, we included in the board packet for reference the template that was provided by the county clerk as well as a proposed resolution, uh, number eight, 2021, that uh, uh, adheres to that template. Um, so it should be, I believe it would be sufficient for purposes of um, allowing the county clerk to do what they need to do in order to, to move forward with calling the election. It has all the elements from the county clerk template related to, for example, being able to charge the district for the cost of the election, being able to consolidate it with any other elections that may be called for the same date, which uh, would reduce the cost to the district of proceeding with the election um, and so forth. And it provides specifics such as, you know, the exact name of the district and the board seat that's up for election. Um, and that's in the packet and the recommendation, the staff recommendation here is that assuming the board wants to move forward with calling an election, recommended to adopt proposed resolution number eight, 2021 uh, by motion. And of course there are alternatives. Board could make changes to the proposed resolution and adopt it with changes um, or the board could take no action. Um, but that would leave it uh, kind of up in the air how the district wanted to proceed with respect to vacant board seat. And uh, there's some additional background that's been in front of you before related to the legal basis for the board uh, taking action to filling the seat, the, the options that the board has in the election process in particular. Uh, and with that, I'll answer any questions that the board may have. Well, Rick Moran has his hand up. I, I don't have any questions for Gina, but uh, after anybody has any questions, I have uh, some comments I'd like to make. Okay, uh, okay, I'll go to uh, questions and then I'll come back to you for comment. Okay. Thank you. So does anybody have a question uh, considering what uh, 
you were just told. Did you were you able to see the memo? I do. Okay. I, I think it's more a point of clarification. Um, in the uh, draft resolution on page two, uh, the term there is, is stated four years ending in 2022. Just, just to be absolutely clear, when this election would take place, it would be one year left on a four-year term. Not that someone's getting a four-year term ending 2022. Um, so I think that's I think that's clear, but I wanted to make sure just in case anybody might have been confused on that. Any other board members have questions? Uh, seeing no questions, I will go back to Rick Moran who wanted to make a statement. Thank you, Lois. Um, <clears throat> In considering this motion, I want to voice uh, some of my concerns. First, I believe that a board member must live in the district they are voted to represent. The present board is within its authority to fill that vacancy as quickly as possible. Due to the compressed time of events and the probable disagreement over a quick appointment, I chose not to do that. Secondly, I will always believe in elections as the best way to, fill our, to fulfill our democratic obligations. I have always tried to be pragmatic and after serious consideration, I realize a few things. One, there is election fatigue in this valley, in this country, everywhere. Our national election nightmare has caused an undue amount of consternation. Two, we are all faced with the stress of this pandemic that is getting worse. And three, we are recovering from the catastrophic CZU fire and possible debris flow. I am willing to reconsider my motion to have a special election. The election laws are too restrictive to have a quick election, and this would drag on until next November. Quick less expensive local water district elections should be available, but they are not. While election costs are burdensome, the cost of good government is a price we should be willing to pay. As for the board's responsibility to, fulfill, to fill this vacancy, we should be aware that two years ago, a slate of three new board members were elected for four years each. Steve Swan's vacancy had two more years left and we should be able to have filled that. It was that vote, it was what, that's what voters wanted. They voted for a platform of infrastructure building, financial responsibility, transparency, stopping the use of glyphosate, expanding the number of citizen members on our committees and creating a more civil atmosphere. We have had two years without drama. We would be regressing on all the progress this board has made and which so many people have acknowledged if this vacancy is filled without the consideration of those facts. To demonstrate, to put action into words that we all want a more civil discourse in our politics, I am asking that tonight the newly elected board members commit to appointing someone who all the board can agree upon. There should be no split decision. The board should unanimously move forward and do the work of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Thank you. Uh, would you mind if I said something? Uh, Not at all, Lois. Okay. Just uh, to remind you, that um, both uh, both you and Lou were picked, and it the whole board picked you, both of you, both times. It was unanimous, and and what we did was um, we asked everyone 
who applied some questions and they all answered the questions. And then uh, it, it came to the board to talk about, uh, and some people like one person, some people like two or three people. And as the discussion went on, you could see how people looking at what the other board members were saying, well, I like uh, Tom and I like Harry and uh, whatever. And somebody else said, well, I like Joe. And then somebody likes all three of them. Anyway, we worked it out. We, it was unanimous both times. And I would imagine it would work that same way. Now, I think um, maybe we could uh, go to the attendees and see what they say to that if board members are have had their say on this. Uh, would that be okay with you, Rick? Uh, yes, well, I would prefer to hear from the board members first and yes. uh, then the attendees. Yes. yes. And I appreciate your comments, Lois, and I agree with them. Okay. All right. A any of the board members have something to say? Okay. Uh, Bob? Uh, interesting idea. Um, I think very much in line with, as I, I think I've been saying now almost every meeting, one of the reasons I'll be disappointed to see Rick leave the board. Um, you have very creative uh, ideas about how to reduce uh, potential conflict um, around board operations. So I'd be very interested in hearing, <clears throat> excuse me, yes, from the um, audience and the uh, newly elected um, board members. Okay. Uh, Lou, uh, we haven't heard from you. Uh, do you have anything you want to say? The only thing I'd like to add is that I hope we can resolve this issue tonight and move forward so that we don't have to discuss this issue again at a board level. Okay. Thank you. You know, I'm having a problem here because I keep thinking I'm missing somebody, forgetting there's only four of us. <laughs> and I keep thinking, who am I not calling on? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's just kind of unnerved me. I, I, I realize there's only four of us. Okay. So if all four of us have had our say, uh, I'll move on to... Um, the public that are in attendance. Okay, thank you. All right, Beth Thomas, do you have your hand up? Thank you, Lois. Um, I, I, I also appreciate Rick Moran for his creative ideas about making this a, a democratic process and really honoring, honoring that um, decision-making uh, model. I'm a Quaker and we always deal in consensus. And so that's my preferred way of doing business. It's not always possible because a lot of people don't understand the give and take of a real consensus model. Um, I'm curious, uh, I'm curious as to how it would work. As I understand it, Rick, you're talking about this decision being made by the current board members and the newly elected board members together. Yeah, and okay. And so since they're not a part of the decision-making tonight, I'm, I'm not certain how that works because a consensus model would really require everyone's agreement. Thank you. Uh, any any uh, others of the public wishing okay, Laura? I think that's Larry Ford. 
Yeah, this is. Uh, I, well, I, I see Larry, but then I saw Laura's uh, hand up too. But okay, Larry Ford. Th thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate everything that's been said so far, and I just want to speak as an individual citizen in the Valley. I, I would like to move on from this decision also, and uh, I'd like to continue working with um, the board and staff to, uh, as I have been over the last year or so, to positively, you know, support the direction that the board is going and this, that the, the kinds of things that the staff needs, um, especially now during these crises where we need to mitigate for uh, damage from the wildfire, where we have the very severe risks of um, debris flow and flooding um, coming in the next few months. And then, uh, as you will expect me to say, to prepare for the next major wildfire that is very likely to come in a few short months from now when we re-enter the fire season. And so um, I would greatly appreciate it if you as a board would change your mind from the previous meeting and decide not to do an election, but uh, as was suggested, consistent with the highest ideals of democracy in our country and in our state and county, um, that you move ahead with the uh, appointment process, which as I understand it, Beth, is, would take several weeks because there has to be an announcement and you have to go through that whole process before you'd be picking who gets appointed. Anyway, um, I think um, it's really too expensive to do an election, both in terms of the uh, fiscal issues, but also for the staff and for the board members, the, the resources that are available are just too, too few. And we need to be dealing with these crises that I mentioned. Um, and I know that uh, delays would occur because of being, uh, you know, short on board members to fill committees and, um, and that kind of thing. So, I really appreciate the conversation that's going on right now, and I and I urge you to move in the, the direction as soon as possible towards appointing some uh, a new board member. Thank you very much. Great. Any other member of the public who wishes to um, speak at this time? Okay. Uh, I saw uh, Kelly Sanford. Okay, Kelly. Hi, yes, I just wanted to voice my agreement with what uh, Larry was saying. Um, I was a little bit shocked that the board would choose to move forward with an election, uh, given everything that's happened and how critical and even what I've learned today about the water board's challenges how critical it will be to have a fully functioning team. And I wanna reiterate how excited I am to have Gail and Tina on the board with their expertise and just how critically important I think it is for them to be involved in this appointment process, which is part of you know, a functioning local government. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen Holt. Yes, I, I wanted to echo the um, points of Larry and Kelly that, and to support Rick's proposal, that um, I feel like the board has moved towards collegiality. I know that Tina and Gail support collegiality too, and that it seems really, I don't know, hypocritical to me to be spending a lot of money on an election when we know how much the whole focus of the board and they were elect, you were elected on a slate that to cut costs, and this seems like not the thing we want to be spending money on, and not just financial money, but also just more, you know, rancor. And so it's much more collegial. It's we're talking about, you know, it's a part of a term, and we have two people on the board who have been, uh, who were appointed, and that's worked really well. And so there's a precedent for this, and it's demonstrated that it worked well, and that we really need continue this and I'm very concerned about the burdens on the current and incoming board members if we and the process that we can't make progress because we're missing somebody 
all along. And it just, it sort of seems to me like, uh, I obviously support the democratic process, but it seems like a fairly straightforward decision to say, let's follow the precedent that's happened before and move forward with this and put out a call because we have time to do it and then try to work together to on a, you know, on somebody that everybody can agree on to the best of abilities. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Christina Wise. Christina. Hi, yes, here we are. Hi, good evening. I'm curious as to what Gail and Tina would weigh in with and what they would like to see the board do because ultimately as newly, um, you know, as, as newly elected members of the board, whatever decisions are made are going to reverberate against them as well. So I'm curious as to where they stand on this position. I'm also wondering, Lois, if you could, can you tell me the total number of attendees for tonight's meeting? Um, there are 15 attendees and then the, the 12 of us. So there's 27 people in this meeting right now. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Gail. I should have said Gail Mayhew. Yeah, I'm responding because of uh, Christina's urging. Um, I was struck that when um, there was a discussion of who would be involved in this conversation, I saw Rick say that it would involve the current board and the next board, and Holly shook her head and said the opposite. And so I'd like to ask Gina, I don't see how there's any legal precedent for what is being uh, requested um, by Director Moran for have, uh, for example, Tina and I have no standing right now. We're, we're simply um, concerned citizens at this point until we're sworn in. And once we're sworn in, um, Director Ferris and Dr., uh, Director Moran don't have any standing. Let me also go on to say that I agree with um, Director Henry that in the past, many of these uh, decisions have been unanimous and, and there's no reason that in many cases they, they shouldn't be. But um, I can't be held hostage to that um, in any way because um, to, to say that we're going to do that means that we um, are not holding true to our responsibility to choose the person that is most qualified. And that's what the application process is for, is to develop, is to determine which people are qualified and then to make a choice um, among those. So Gina, could you just um, elaborate on whether you think what um, Director Moran has suggested is actually something that is doable? I I don't think Tina, I don't see Tina's name. I think she said Gina. Gina, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, I was asking Gina. Uh, she was asking Gina, yes. Yeah. Chair Henry, that's that's up to you if you want to refer those questions to me or any, you know, any of them. I, I'm fine with you answering a question. Um, okay, so I'll do, I'll do my best here uh, as best I sort of understood the questions. Um, and maybe this goes without saying, maybe not. Um, of course, at this point, the newly elected directors don't have any kind of a say in, in what the board decides to do. Um, but if this process is still going on, uh, once the new directors take office, that could change. Um, in terms of the proposal to have a consensus process, uh, I don't, my interpretation of that proposal is that it's not to have some kind of a legally binding process. And um, maybe this should really go back to you, Director Moran, but as I understood it, you're trying to get sort of a commitment on the record to a consensus process that would not be, you know, binding on whoever ends up making the decision because it couldn't be. Right. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Rick Moran, do you want to respond to that? Uh, certainly, Rose. Um, I realize that this is not, I, I, you know, there's two boards changing uh, members here at the time here. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, usurp any power or any position or any votes here. My time is coming quickly to an end. Um, what I'm trying to um, voice here is there is a large number of people who supported Fultz, Henry, and Swan, afford, uh, uh, supported a platform, and <clears throat> the people that voted for that um, have a um, have expect that that platform be followed through, okay? And um, I understand Lois's point about uh, previous uh, appointees have been unanimous. Um, I just need, and I think the people that supported that platform and supported Steve and are disappointed that he's not here to fulfill that platform uh, need some sort of um, verbal commitment, of, you know, just like they would make a campaign promise. They promise to, you know, clean up the sewers or clean up, you know, add more money to the pipes. Just a, a, a verbal commitment that they can be held, uh, you know, see a record of that they supported this. They support the um, process of trying to find a consensus to uh, approve the next vacancy. There's a number of people, again, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna repeat myself, there's a, no, a large number of people who voted two years ago to um, pursue this platform. And they don't wanna give it up just because um, two new members came, uh, got elected. That, that, that's not what uh, those people anticipated. And um, because of Mr. Swan's uh, resignation and cho choosing to live in Texas, uh, we're put in a very difficult situation. And I'm trying to find a way out of it that still protects the interest of those people that supported that platform. And I read off all those things that they uh, promised to do, and they have been doing those, making good on those promises. That's what I'm trying to do is make sure those people get their voice heard and uh, acknowledged. Okay. I maybe Gail doesn't feel like she wants to commit to that, but uh, certainly I think it would be uh, not holding anybody hostage to acknowledge that a large number of people two years ago supported this platform. And I want to see that platform pursued. Uh, Luke, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. I, I meant to say, Rick. Uh, so would you repeat those items of the platform? Uh, you're muted. You're muted, Bill. They voted for a platform of infrastructure building, financial responsibility, transparency, stopping the use of glyphosate, expanding the number of citizen members on committees, and creating a more civil atmosphere. And they're, they're, you know that's just my summarization. There, Bob may have uh, some clarification there. Yeah, but. I mean, I heard what you say said, and I, I, I personally believe that the two board members would be doing those very things. Uh, uh, but I can't speak for them, and <laughs> I, I could ask, uh, I could go back and ask. Uh, okay, Bob. Well, there, there's a couple of things that I that I want to bring out on the table, and um, you know they're they're probably uncomfortable, but um, 
you know, I, I think we need to, to recognize this. Um, you know, there was a real, in my opinion, lack of transparency around Steve's um, situation. And, you know, based on when his house was sold and when his time here came to an end, which was 40 plus years, and I'm very sad to see him go, but that event happened at a point in time where had that been dealt with in a more forthright and transparent fashion, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We'd be having a different conversation perhaps, but not this conversation. And for whatever reason, there was this sense on his part that he needed to use a um, clause in the water code, I believe it was, to justify him continuing to represent people even though he didn't live here anymore and had no intention, more importantly, no intention of coming back. That, that to me is, is really disappointing and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sad that we got to this point where by the time we could get around to dealing with it, we were now running up against deadlines and, and the like and post-election uh, situation that, that we simply wouldn't have um, had we dealt with it in September like we should have. Um, and so that's, you know, that, that's one thing. Um, on the other uh, side of this, I am a big believer in elections to begin with, but I am especially so when there is, in fact, a um, philosophical, perhaps is, is a word, split on the board. Um, you know, two years ago in 2018, um, the slate that I was on was opposed um, by the uh, people that supported Gail and Tina. I mean, if you look at the roster on both endorsement lists, it's, you know, 80%, 85% overlap. And so what we have here is definitely a um, question mark inside of the community as to where the emphasis needs to be. What are the issues, in fact, that are most important to the voters? And really, the only way that you can address that is through an election. Um, you know, I, I keep hearing, you know, people talk about the cost of the election. Yes, I, I get that. There is a cost to our democratic process. But I also want to remind folks that might be listening to this as well that we agreed to pay three times the amount for a consultant on the day that we uh, voted to go to an election. And there have been other examples of where, in my opinion, we have overpaid for consultants. I am, when it comes to priority, spending priorities, budgets, of course, are a reflection of a board member's priorities. I place the priority of our democratic process at the top of the pyramid. Nothing more important than that from the point of view of the board operations. I place putting money in the hands of consultants to produce reports that are really nothing more, historically, have been nothing more than something we put on the shelf and use in order to make sure we can get grants, but that don't impact our operations in any way, shape, or form. And we spend tens of thousands of dollars on it I looked at those things as a low priority. Those are the things that I would like us to stop doing because if they don't bring us any benefit, there's no reason to keep doing the same thing over and over again. There's a word for that. Um, and so whether that's going to the legislature to make changes, what have you, those are the kinds of things that we need to do to lighten the load of the amount of money that we shovel into consultants' pockets here. It is an enormous amount of money. So from my point of view, my spending priorities are clear. Um, other folks may have different spending priorities. They may view spending money on consultants as more important than spending money on an election. Um, okay, that's part of the conversation that we would have. And so um, I'm intrigued by 
Rick's proposal, because if we could get to a commitment that we would seat a board member with only a 4-0 vote, even though this is not legally binding, I, you know, it, it's clear this is not legally binding. This is a, um, this is sort of a campaign promise, I think is what Rick said. Um, if we could do that, that might be something that, um, that might work. Short of that, I think where we have this split in philosophy between the, um, and emphasis, and it may be a matter of emphasis uh, more than anything else, I guess we'll find out over the next few months. Um, I think you have to go to an election to make that happen. Um, so far, I haven't heard the commitment that if we can't get to a 4-0 vote, we won't seat somebody. Um, I believe, uh, let me also say this about qualifications. Um, our system of governance in this district is a citizen governance process. Um, it, it is a process where any citizen in our valley, should they be motivated enough, should they be um, interested enough, um, every citizen in our valley has the opportunity to serve in this board if they wish to. Whether they get to it or not is a different thing, but the, the qualifications, <coughs> excuse me, that I'm looking for may be very different than the qualifications other people look for. I personally believe the vast majority of our community could serve in this board in a capacity, bring the skill sets that they have, the life experiences they have, and a commitment to learning about the other things that need to be learned about. I think that covers, you know, the vast percentage of our, of our population. I'm not particularly concerned about our ability to find a person who would be acceptable to all parties um, to serve on, on the board. I think that is, and, and I do believe that part of what we need to be looking for here is a transition to uh, what I would call the, we've talked about this before, next generation. Um, we need to be bringing folks um, that are new to our community, that have been here for a while, have families, um, have a commitment to uh, being here and growing here, we need to bring them into this process as well. And I would certainly be looking to do that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Lou, you wish to speak? Yes, <clears throat> something quick. I want to point out that uh, we've been going back and forth between the public and the board members. And I'd like to, to, to uh, point out to, um, to President Henry a point of order, and that is you had yielded the floor to the public. So I think allowing the board members to speak is is not right. I think the public have, there's four people waiting to speak and are waiting patiently. I think we should turn it over to the public and leave it there until they're all done. Okay. Can I comment on that? Yes. I, I agree generally, Lou. I think it's a good thing to, to make sure that we get all the public input, but I do believe the proposal that Rick has made is one where there is probably a little bit more interactivity that needs to go on, um, sort of in a perhaps less formal manner. And, and I, I believe that Lois is handling this well in terms of having a little bit of that uh, back and forth even though it's not according to our um, sort of strict operating guidelines, I think this is a very important issue that we need to uh, have that flexibility on. Okay, any other board member have a comment? Okay, uh, I'm going to go to attendees. Uh, and I, and I'm going to have to, uh, I think the way things are going, I have to uh, let you uh, speak. If you've already spoken, let you speak again, because I, it, it's just the way it is. It's not normally what I would do, but okay. Cynthia. Uh, um. This is Cynthia, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to respond to what Director Foltz 
uh, just said. Uh, I have watched the board meetings. I have seen many resolutions accepted where there was one person not in agreement. I don't think it is reasonable to tie the hands of the board by letting one person have a veto over the majority. And I trust that the new board members are going to have the same values that Rick expressed, which is to try to serve the public to the best of their ability. I think that the people who are expressing their opinions are those who cared enough to vote and attend board meetings, and they should be considered more than the people who have not cared enough to participate. So I hope that you will use a little common sense and proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Bozier. Oh yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I wanna thank uh, the board uh, for having me speak and for your careful deliberation on this. And I guess I, my comment is, it is also directed to Director Folks's comments. Uh, as someone who was very active uh, in 2018, it has been my goal since then to try to build consensus, find areas of agreement, um, and move forward. And when, when Director Moran listed the planks from that election, I agreed with all of them. Um, and I, I just think it's for the betterment of the district and for the our community, especially in this um, period, for us to find ways to heal, to find commonality, to move forward together, I believe, uh, that you as a board have been working to do that. I think it's time for us to look forward. I just want to note that, uh, uh, that in this election, there was, uh, there was, uh, there were some echoes of 2018, but it was a very different election. The two people that were elected had nothing to do with the 2018 election. Uh, they bring forward some new ideas and uh, uh, one is in the new generation. I think we can expect a, a board of excellence as we move forward. Um, and I think it's important to maintain the, um, the a process of appointment to be, uh, a, a, the goal is consensus, uh, but that there shouldn't be uh, a campaign promise at this point that uh, that it would have to be unanimous. It had, the goal is uh, to have consensus, but the, the purpose of it is to pick who the board thinks is the most qualified. Um, so I appreciate uh, Director Moran's efforts here. I think that, that the instinct is right. Um, and I think, but I think we need to move forward uh, in an expeditious way um, to get a new member on the board as and I agree with what Larry Ford said about the reasons why we should wait, move forward with an appointment rather than an election. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elaine Fresco. Hi, yes. Um, you know, as uh, everyone else has said, I, I do appreciate Director Moran's reconsideration of his support for the election. Um, I believe that it's entirely possible that the new board could all agree on a replacement for Steve Swan. Um, I know that the new elected board members believe strongly in collaboration. Steve Swan ran on the slate with, with uh, Director Folks and Director Moran and his decision to leave, I don't know, I don't know what you're implying Director Folks to, about his decision to leave, but it had nothing to do with uh, the newly elected board members. Um, and I have to say that I am continually upset by your use of the term, the opposition. I suggested that Gail should run because 
She was not involved in any way in, in the election two years ago. She did not write any letters about glyphosate as, as uh, Small, Director Smallman accused her of, which was ridiculous. Um, and, and she ran such a positive campaign. I, I'm very curious if either you, Director Fulton, or you, Director Moran, even read her lengthy replies to the questions that the press banner asked her and the other candidates, or if you went on her website to read her goals and priorities, I can't believe that you would disagree with any of them. And, and I would think that you would appreciate how helpful she's been to the um, rate payers in explaining their water quality and, 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 and debris flows. I do think that putting restrictions on the board members will give uh, uh, you, Director Fultz, more power. But on the other hand, I know you, and I think that you're perfectly qualified to, to express your opinion and come to an agreement with the other board members. So um, I don't know why all this drama about this thing. I would like it. I, I think we, the board, the district needs to get on with the real issues and settle this once and for all. Thanks. Uh, just to clarify one thing with you, Elaine, I'm the one who ran with uh, Steve and Bob, not Rick Moran. Uh, Gail. Thank you. Um, I, and I'll just follow up on that comment in that um, it was indeed Lois Henry that ran in that slate. And um, so I really regret that Director Fultz seems to want to put us in a them versus us mentality. This was something that both Tina and I really wanted to transcend. And I think that if uh, Lois really believed that I was going to betray um, the sorts of things that she cared about and the slate uh, cared about, um, that she wouldn't have chosen to endorse me. I would also say that if you had read my uh, website or the answers uh, to the uh, Christina Wise in the press banner. Um, everything you said, Rick, I I support, um, and in fact I explicitly support, with the exception of um, glyphosate, and that's because I consider it a settled law. That the the fact that that was uh, part of the slate and that was what uh, the public voted for in 2018, um, I respect that and I would not do anything to change that. So I didn't even think that was something that was up for debate. If you read my um, website, you'll also see that I make an explicit um, statement, Director Fultz, about the fact that we spend far too much money, as far as I'm concerned, on uh, consultants and uh, that I would hope that we could figure out a way to use less of them uh, and in the future. So I'm, I'm totally with you on that one. And I, and I just, um, I, I think that actually you and I agree on a lot of things. And um, I, I think you'll find that I will actually be somebody you can work with um, on, on the board. And um, so I, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm just hoping that um, I, can convince you that I, I think that it, it will be possible and I support everything that that slate uh, ran for, um, fiscal responsibility, the infrastructure, the um, having cordial relationships as we run the board, um, having more uh, people uh, public on our committees, transparency, all of those things are things that I support and I'm pretty sure that Tina, I'm not sure she can be here tonight also uh, supported as as well. So I, 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 I guess I'm more hopeful about this. And I, I really don't think that there's a them versus us mentality. And I, and I don't think the people that voted for us uh, feel that way, because we wouldn't have gotten as many votes as, as we did if that were it. Thank you. Any other members would like to speak? Okay. Seeing none. Oh, there is one more left. Hmm? I think oh, Joni just put her hand up. Okay. Okay, Joni. 
Thank you. I just want to say, um, as a ratepayer, I really appreciate that uh, Rick Moran has come up with a way of revisiting the idea of the special election because I was really deeply saddened that there was the possibility of such potential financial waste at a time when um, you know, so many people in the Valley are suffering financially and the district itself has so many unexpected costs and you know, we need to focus on the rebuilding and we need to be ready for what else could come in the case of other potential disasters. And I am just so heartened by the fact that, Rick, you had the courage and creativity um, to say, let's take a second look at that decision. And I applaud you. And I hope that however you end up coming to this decision, that you will step away from that ledge of the special elections this time, because you know, elections and democracy are important. I don't think the water district has lacked for elections in the past. And um, if there's ever a year to forego a special election, I feel like this would be it. So thank you for the the fresh perspective and the pause on, on that um, momentum toward the special election. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Uh, Myra Paul. My name is Paul uh, uh, Macklis in Felton, and I would also like to appreciate the fact that this has been opened up again for consideration. I was disappointed to think that we would be spending um, so much money on an election. And I think most ratepayers would like to see us not spend money unnecessarily on pointless consultancies and elections that could be avoided. So I think we shouldn't set up a false dichotomy. Um, all of uh, the ratepayers want to see money spent wisely. And I think we have heard from at least one of the new um, incoming directors. And it sounds to me very hopeful that the four members in the future could come to an agreement. And I hope that you're able to support that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Laura. Hi, um, my name's Laura Triana. I've been a resident of San Lorenzo Valley for about 20 years, a direct rate payer for most of them and a voter for both the elections we've been talking about um, in the meeting today. I also wanna thank Director Moran for his attempts to find a way to avoid the cost of an election and also the cost of not having a board trustee um, on the board for about a year while we wait for that potential special ele election to happen. Um, and I appreciate Director Fultz's willingness to be open to consider using the appointment process. Um, while I don't think it's reasonable to require a 4-0 vote um, for that appointment, I think it's clear based on the comments and the board elect members' um, actual stands in the election um, that the whole board want, is committed to transparency and having an open discussion and through the open board member process of making that appointment, I'm really confident that um, this can really um, be a beneficial to go through an appointment process with the new directors as they're seated. Thank you for this time. Thank you. Any Anyone else? <laughs> I'm looking, looking. <laughs> okay. I, I do not see anyone else. I'm gonna go back to the board. Okay. Um, okay, I got Gina uh, up there first. I thank you, Chair Henry. And um, I see that the district manager also has his hand up. If he wants to go first here, uh, I would defer to him. But um, I, I guess I just wanna say with, with all respect to the board, um, whose decision this is and, and has to be, um, and to the members of the public who are so you know, committed to this issue and concerned about it, that um, as the district's lawyer looking down the road, I see, um, potentially a lot of turmoil that could result 
if this doesn't get resolved one way or the other um, here tonight. Um, I uh, also have concerns, frankly, as the district council, and I know there are a lot of responses to this, but about having a four member board for a year, um, in a year where we've already gone through wildfires with emergency meetings and debris flow, we don't know what the future will hold. And there are uh, challenges that come with having a four member board. Um, because there is business that the district needs to conduct um, and that often takes a majority vote of the board in order to move that forward. Um, I uh, do agree, you know, the, the proposal that uh, Director Moran has made that perhaps an appointment could go forward if unanimously supported by the board as I, as I interpret that, because it has to be interpreted not as a legally binding commitment, it's not something that would force any board member or any incoming board member to vote in a particular way. It couldn't be enforced in any way whatsoever. If somebody had reasons to do something else, I suppose that could happen. I, I, but I do think that what has been proposed is a reasonable way to get folks, to get the, the decision makers of this community on board to reach a solution, all four of them um, mutually to move the district forward on from this issue. And, you know, just from my point of view, where as I said, as district council, to have a full complement of board members uh, going into this coming year with all of the new challenges that it may bring on top of the old challenges that we faced this past year. So. Um, you know, I, 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 again, with all respect to the board members, I don't purport to, you know, I try to stay as neutral as I possibly can, but I do have legal concerns related to this, and I wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rick Rogers. Thank you, uh, Chair Henry. I, I, I kind of want to echo what council said and from the perspective of your district manager, I too believe this is a board decision. However, uh, in all transparency, uh, I was fortunate enough to meet with director Moran and talk with him uh, on this situation. And I find uh, his comments to be why director Moran is such a great director. He's very passionate about this board and about moving uh, moving the business of the, of the district forward. I just have concerns if we go to election that we'll be in election mode and not uh, governing mode for the next two years. I see a much more contentious time over the next two years by constantly being campaigning in an election. We have fire recovery. We have Santa Margarita groundwater. We have a serious financial situation right now to address due to uh, fire recovery and COVID due to uh, you know, the economy. I believe that the board could come together. I've seen it many a times and find an individual. First, that individual has to apply uh, and select. The board always seems to work well together at this time uh, of bringing a, a new member on the board. And I just, I have concerns of moving forward and running the district that with four directors, it'll be a contentious time until we get back up to five and then we'll be right back in campaign mode again. I mean, we spent some time with, uh, uh, with some training on contentious issues and so forth on how to bring the board together. I think it was somewhat successful, but she had a lot of these same points about, you know, you're no longer campaigning, now you need to govern. And we got a lot of governing to do uh, starting, you know, the first of the year once the new board gets seated. Uh, so I, you know, I really need, I really would request that you think, you know, think it through and it is your decision. And obviously, you know, Hey, staff supports your decision, but we do have a lot to get done over the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I call on you, uh, where did Bob I, I want to say one thing. Um, I haven't said anything because I voted no, and I don't believe I should speak. 
That's the only reason I haven't talked. Um, so, uh, Bob, do you still want to talk or? I'm, I'm going to let Rick go first. You're going to what? I would like Rick to go first. This is his proposal. Okay. He oh, has his camera. Rick Moran, you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll defer to anybody and everybody, but uh, as long as I get my shot at it. Uh, so I appreciate everybody's comments. I'm glad to see that so many people are here to try and uh, participate in this to try to uh, square this away. Pardon an old Navy phrase here. Um, I first want to try to answer uh, Beth uh, Thomas's question. And I appreciate her uh, Quaker training. Um, and I, I think, uh, Beth, to that, there's a certain amount of risk here and there's a certain amount of trust that has to happen, right? So that's wherever these contentious issues that have existed in this community, I'm trying to uh, bridge that with some trust and there's a little bit of risk that goes along with that, okay? Now, there's many people that made comments, I can't answer them all, um, but um, one of the things that I've uh, learned to do is not necessarily listen to the most numerous voices in the room. Uh, I've been part of trying to make the most numerous voices in the room, so always not listen to, and for good reason, because there's a lot of people who can't participate in the um, hard work it is to come to meetings and to be uh, informed about the background of issues, okay? So, <clears throat> I appreciate what uh, Rick Rogers had to say, and I, I want to make sure that uh, when Rick and I met, it was at my behest that I asked to meet with him, okay? Um, and what I'm trying to find, and I, I, you know, is some sort of compromise. And what I've heard um, is um, enough people speak in favor of consensus, uh, collegial proceedings, those are the kinds of things that I need to hear. Um, I Again, I realized through genus counseling that, you know, this is not a legal uh, commitment that we can make and nobody's trying to uh, hold anybody hostage here. But we are trying to make sure that people are committed to uh, working collegially together and creating a civil discourse. That's how I got involved in this water district. And uh, it's a theme that I continue to press forward on. So I've heard to my satisfaction, um, people speak to their desire to do that. So um, that that's, so I'm, I'm happy to, I've heard people uh, say that, okay? Um, and I'll kind of leave it at that. I, I'm gonna ask later for Gina's help in uh, possibly wording a motion, how to get up, because I, I do want to get through this uh, tonight, but I'm, I'm believe me, as much as I want to get through this tonight, I'm gonna take my time and we're gonna do this right, okay? So if anybody's impatient or needs to go take a break, uh, then go ahead. But I'm going to slowly walk this through so it is clear and clean of what we're doing here tonight. Thank you, Lois. Okay. Uh, Director Folk. Yeah, there's a, a number of uh, thoughts I have as I was listening to the, the conversation. Um, these aren't in any particular priority order or importance order, but just just some thoughts about what we what we've been talking about um i, I agree with rick um there are more voices in our community than than those that attend the meetings and I, you know i've said this consistently from from day one that um you know my job as a board member and i would certainly hope that anybody serving on the board or who would like to serve in the board or who may someday in the future serve in the board recognize that it's not just the folks that are in the room that you are representing. Um, 
or that you're having a conversation with. It is a much, much broader set of people, a much, much broader set of concerns. For the most part, most people are going to be um, uh, looking to the board to do the work on their behalf so that they don't have to come to each one of the, the board meetings. They're gonna look for the board to advance um, uh, what it what it or each board member promised to do as part of their campaign platform. Uh, that's why you know the promises to me are very, very important. So I, I will have to respectfully disagree with uh, some of the um, comments expressing that we are to listen to only or at least mostly the, the folks that are in the room. Um, I, I'm, um, I, I'm still sort of in the camp of, I think an election is probably still a better way to go. Um, you know, the, the school board, and, and I don't wanna minimize our challenges, but the school board also has its challenges and um, they are going to an election. Uh, we could have been able to make that election had we been able to deal with Steve's vacancy in a timely fashion. Um, that notice that was required would have had to have been granted, I think it was October 24th or something like that. So about a month after Steve actually sold his house, that would have been plenty of time for us to do that and be able to allow the people the ability to have their voices heard, which to me is much, much better than even four people or five people having um, a say. Um, and that to me is, is extremely disappointing. Um, there, there's no question that the school district itself is going through lots of issues right now. I can only imagine all of them. Um, and they're able to do it with a four person board. I, I don't have any doubt that we will as well. Um, for the most part, as I've expressed before, my experience on, re, on um, studying board um, behavior and board votes and having served on boards, um, you know, 80 to 90%, sometimes even higher of the votes are all gonna be unanimous. There are gonna be votes where that is not going to be the case. And for me, for example, um, this past um, uh, couple, three months, you know, the, the, the votes that I've taken in opposition to the majority have been around rate increases, have been around our budget, where our budget has uh, basically consumed the entire, the operating expense increase, consumed the entire amount of the rate increase, which we're just running in place, not voting for consultants, um, uh, you know, contracts that I think are really large. And, and so that's the area that we're likely to see perhaps some disagreement, but based on the comments that I've heard so far, um, and, and the comments that we heard during the budget and the rate increase and all that, um, I think I will probably be the only voice, uh, you know, in opposition again uh, next year, should we have a budget uh, that mirrors what we did this year. Um, so, out, but outside of that, when it comes to disaster recovery, um, I don't see a whole lot of, uh, I don't see a lot of issues here with our ability to keep the work moving forward. And I want to assure Rick that it is definitely not my intention, and I don't believe it is any other board member's intention to in any way, shape, or form do things that would in fact hold up the district's ability to move forward on fire recovery. I think we need to have a conversation about how best to reconstruct our raw water uh, collection line. Um, that is a conversation that will probably take uh, a while to have, but that's a conversation we need to have with our community anyway. And so that's not one you're just gonna bang out in a, in a couple, three days or a, a board meeting. That, that's gonna be a, a lengthy conversation. And then outside of that, in terms of you know voting for recovery, that sort of thing, board members is gonna work um, uh, just as well. Um, so I, I'm, I'm still not, um, I, I guess, Rick, I'm still not completely um, uh, comfortable with with the proposal, but I'm continuing to listen. And I'd like to hear perhaps from Lou and 
and Lois what they uh, what they think about as well. I know Lois has said she didn't vote for the election last time. That's fine. At this point in time, we're talking about a different proposal. And uh, so I, I'd like to hear some more before uh, making up my mind. Uh, but again, it's it's an incredibly creative way to try to do the work of the district in a consensus fashion. And, and if that is the pleasure of the board, I certainly hope everybody is moving in that direction. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lou, did you want to say anything? Sure. Thank you, Lois. Um, last board meeting, I asked Rick Rogers to comment on this topic. He respectfully declined, and I understand why, but I'm glad that he volunteered his input for this meeting because knowing that this is going to be a very onerous effort on the staff for basically being, as he put it, in election mode for, for the next year, um, that that really goes a long way towards uh, changing my thinking. Um, but I would like to, to also point out that we're, we're faced basically with a binary decision here. It's either election or it's appointment. And I'd like to point out that if we do decide tonight to go to go the appointment route, we have a very, very short time frame. If we don't make, if we don't take action before January 4th, it's out of our hands and with the Board of Supervisors. So that's why I said earlier, we need to make a decision tonight because if that decision is to change our, our, our um, path and go on appointment, we, we need to do that. We need to be real exp expeditious on how we move forward. That's all I'll say at this point. Thank you, Lou. Um, Rick Moran, uh, you want to get him, uh, uh, Gina to help you with the motion, is that it? Uh, yes, but I think Bob uh, asked if you would um, make your comments available to us, Lois. If, if you don't want to do that, I, I think that Bob well, would I, say- My understanding it. is that I can't. Well, yeah, you can. I voted against this. No, you can, of course, comment on this. There's nothing stopping you from doing well, that. Well, that isn't my understanding. Well, where did you get the, I mean, so that, could, I understand could that. Gina, could Gina clarify that? I mean, it yeah, depends I, on what kind of motion you're talking about. If you're talking about a motion to rescind, that has to be done by a person that voted in favor of the resolution you're wanting to rescind, but that doesn't stop you from talking about it. Uh, could, could we get Gina? Yeah, um, it's correct that there are limits on who can make a motion to reconsider. Um, it doesn't prevent any director from participating in the discussion. Right. Okay. Okay. I believe the appointment process has worked well in the past. Uh, it's been transparent. Um, I, I certainly never went out and tried to get people to apply. Um, and I, I wouldn't do it this time. Uh, and as just, just so you know, um, I, when it, before I knew if Rick Moran or Lou Ferris were going to run for sure or not, I said I absolutely could not endorse anybody until I knew whether they were going to run or not because I feel a loyalty to board members. Um, when uh, Rick Moran told me he wasn't going to run. Um, I uh, endorsed Gail Mayhood. Uh, I believe that it is be a waste of time. It would cause a train wreck if we go to election and that person, the person running for election, if they want to put a statement in, I, I mean, it can cost a lot of money. 
And I, I can't see putting people through that for just one year. They would only be on the board one year if they were elected. It, it just, it doesn't seem right to me. That, that's all I want to say. Okay. So uh, if that satisfies Bob's willing, uh, desire to have everybody heard, I'll ask Gina for a little bit of help here. Okay. Is that okay with you, uh, President Henry? Shall yep. we take a break while you're doing that? What was that? Um, I think Rick was asking for Gina to help him out a little bit. And I was yeah. suggesting maybe we yeah. take a little break while he does that. Uh, do you need a break? Well, you talk. Yeah, you know, a short recess would help. Yeah. Um, how do we recess? Um, we recess. <laughs> I turn video off and go mute. Are we going to turn our ears off? I, I mean, I don't understand where you're going. Uh, well, this would be I like a. We can stop. I don't think we can stop CTV. I think record. I think we'll still be broadcasting live. Yeah, yeah uh, but I mean, uh, we basically the the board uh, takes a little recess, and uh, Gina, I don't know if there's special provisions around this for online meetings versus in public. But in public, we would basically take a short recess, right? Right. I mean, there could be a recess here, as Rick points out, the cameras will keep running and it'll be up to each individual user whether to uh, yeah. stop their video. Um, yeah, of mute, mute this, if you mute and uh, leave and come back, I, that yeah. should be fine. Yeah. And that way, Rick and, and Gina can work on uh, language. Well, and I, um, sure. I, I mean, do you want us to work on language while you're not there? I could propose language right now. I'm pre I'm prepared for that. Okay, that's fine. I, that's okay. Fine. Um. It's, so if we okay, push ahead, Bob. Yeah, sure. Fine with me. I okay. thought maybe you needed a little more time than that. So. No, I I I I'm going to try and push ahead here. Okay. okay so. so, Gina, what uh I would like to try and do here is um, back us out of our commitment to have an election and to propose that we proceed as quickly as possible to have the new board or to the staff go through and seek um, applications for uh, the vacant seat. Okay, would it be all right, Director Moran, to take that in two pieces? Yes, it would. Okay, because um, I think legally it's especially important to do the first part first. And that would be, uh, I would propose a motion to um, reconsider and rescind the board's motion uh, adopted, or, I'm sorry, the board's motion passed on November 10th. Uh, calling for a special election. So, um, point, point I would have ordered. I, I would have to hear both motions before I'd vote on any motion. So, could you do that, Gina? Could you say what the next motion would be um, on top of that? Uh, okay, I, I could try that. Um, yeah. Let me just, the, the reason that gets complicated is because um, I'm assuming that based on what you said, Director Moran, that what would happen upon the reconsideration and rescission of the calling for a special election is that the board would move forward with an appointment. And yes. that means choosing a date for the closing of uh, uh, the, the closing of, of date and time for the uh, closing of the receipt of applications by the district to fill the vacant board seat. Um, and so I can just throw out a date and uh, it, you know, I, I guess I'd pick something that provides a, a couple of days buffer so that, you know, we're not trying to do this in exactly 15 days, but something a little more than that. But of course it's awkward because it pushes the process into the holiday season. So um, 
with that, with that long winded caveat, I could go ahead and suggest something. Um, and then I guess it could be discussed. Could I say something here? Your next week is Thanksgiving. And I, I feel like it needs to be more than 15 days. And granted, people may not be going anywhere, but people are going to be cooking, and doing whatever they do with their immediate family. And I, I really think it needs to be more than 15 days and that it ought to be, it almost seems like it'd be a lot to put on the new board for their very first meeting on, on the uh, 7th of December. Just, just what I'm thinking. So uh, okay. you can do whatever, it, it's up to you, Rick Moran. Okay, and as I'm thinking through this, Gina, help me, um, that if the applications are in before the January, uh, our first meeting in January, do we meet the legal obligations that Lou had talked about? Uh, no, because the first meeting in January will be after the deadline. Uh, okay, so some meeting uh, before that, so the, whatever last meeting in December there is. Yeah, well, let me suggest there isn't a meeting right now that I think is really adequate to, to do this. Um, I mean, in theory, the deadline could be met for a December 7th meeting, but there would be very little time to review the applications. So yeah. um, now the, the board does not necessarily right now have to decide what the dates of those meetings would be, but it would have to decide on a closing date for the app receipt of applications because that's part of the package that gets uh, you know part of the notice that goes to the public about how to submit their applications. So do you have um, a do you have a suggestion for that date? Yeah, I mean I, I could just looking at a calendar, I could throw out December 9th at 3 p.m. Uh, as the closing date and time for the receipt of applications by the district secretary. Okay, if that's what fulfills our legal obligation and gives uh, you, you know. I, I realize this is all compressed here. There's a lot of moving parts going on here, and I hope people will be flexible and uh, forgiving if it seems a little hurried here. But this is what we've been left with, uh, and we're trying to make the best of that. So December 9th. Yeah, at 3 p.m. At 3 p.m. Do we need to set the, the date for the meeting to review applications and appoint? Um, I don't, I, I mean, that would be good, I suppose, but I, I'm a little, because it would give a lot of notice, but I, I'm concerned that if we did it, we wouldn't be able to stick to it because um, nobody knows the board's schedule for that time. Okay, we, I, we could pick that date then on the 7th? Uh, yeah, the 3rd or the 7th. Well, the new board will be seated on the 7th. We could pick that date. Well, to be accurate, the new board is eligible to be seated on the 4th. That's correct, but I do believe we're scheduled to swear in at a board meeting on the 7th. Well, they, they can go get sworn in early if they want. Let, Lou has his hand up. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Um, are we sure that the, the election department for the county is going to certify the election by December 3rd or 7th or 9th or whatever. They if have they to by December 1st. If they don't, I'm sorry? Uh, Lou, they have to by December 1st. I talked to them. Okay, so we have reason to believe that that ending we do after the, the December 1st is going to be appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So we're getting we're getting some dates here. We're, we're fine narrowing this down here. All right. So if um, Bob had suggested he wanted to hear uh, the second uh, motion, um, and I, I'm the my intent of the motion. I'm not asking you, Gina, to make that motion 
or to uh, craft it yourself. My intent is what I'm asking you to clarify and put in uh, the best uh, legal terms for us to proceed here, okay? Um, and that would be to have the new board um, read, read, read the applications and appoint a new member. That's my intent. You tell me how to best to get there. Okay. Um, consistent with the types of motions the district has made before when teeing up an appointment process, I would recommend a motion along the lines of um, uh, moving to fill the vacant board seat by appointment under government code section 1780 and to set the closing date and time for the receipt of applications as December 9th uh, at 3 p.m. Okay. Now, excuse me, Lois, if I could just... Um, One thing, Bob yeah. has his hand up again. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to try to do. And, and Rick, so, I mean, obviously there is nothing in the motion that can um, obligate anybody to the consensus um, process that you would like to see, where we only do a appointment on a 4-0 vote. You're comfortable that you heard a commitment from um, Gail, at least, that that, in fact, is her intention. Yes, I am. And from other people who are uh, concerned about this process as well. Okay. 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 All right. And we get on with this then. Um, Gina, you're helping him out here. Are, are you satisfied, uh, Rick Moran, with? Yes, as I see it, uh, President Henry, that uh, I'm going to make a motion to reconsider and resend calling for a special election. And after that vote, I'm going to make a motion to uh, wherever my notes are to uh, fill the vacancy by December 9th at 3 p.m. And Gina has the precise wording on that, that that's my intent here. So, yes. And you're comfortable with that. Yes, I am. Do you, do you mind, Director Moran, if I restate that briefly consistent with your intent? Uh, go ahead, right ahead, please. Okay. Um, a motion to reconsider and rescind uh, the board's motion passed on November 10th to call for a special election and a motion to fill the vacant board seat by appointment pursuant to government code section 1780 and set the closing date and time for receipt of applications as uh, December 9th uh, by 3 p.m. I so make that motion okay. as stated. Okay, do we have a second? I guess I can second that. Okay, is that right, Gina, can I do that? You can second that motion. Okay, uh, Bob, you have your hand up. Yeah, I do. Uh, this is this is an interesting situation for me, and again, um, uh, I want I want to make some comments here that I think um, probably have the definite potential of uh, perhaps upsetting one or more of the attendees. But you know, again, for me, it's it's important to state what reality is and make sure that um, we're being transparent about that. And this is not being done in any way, shape, or form to be um, to be hostile or aggressive or anything like that. It's simply business. It's a statement of fact. So when the when the new board is seated, um, I will be the sole member on the board that did not support the election of. Uh, Gail and Tina to the board. I supported um, two other people. And so Rick, what you're what you're doing here um, through this process, what you're encouraging, I think me to do, 
is to take a huge uh, leap of faith and trust that in fact, we as four people who have as their main um, objective to serve the community in the best way possible um, and with the campaign done um, to move forward in a way that is uh, collegial and um, courteous, even if perhaps we disagree, that we can achieve a four to zero vote. Um, I'm not sure I heard a commitment to that, but I certainly heard everybody say, well, that's what's happened in the past and you know, we're, we're very hopeful we can achieve that uh, in the future. Um, on a, and on a personal note, um, I recognize that even though I did not support Gail and Tina in the most recent election, that Gail and Tina bring to the board their backgrounds, their expertise, their willingness to serve, their dedication, hopefully to serve all four years and to uh, invest the time and energy into it that is required uh, to do so, particularly challenging for folks that um, may still have other obligations um, uh, in, in front of them uh, based on where they are in their, in their life and their career and that sort of thing. And then I'm committed to do that. I mean, it is an important thing for boards to find as much common ground as they possibly can find and to achieve a working relationship that is collegial, courteous, businesslike, and gets the business of the district done in a way that makes our district better. I don't expect that we're going to agree in everything. Um, and I don't expect that we will um, necessarily have 100% unanimous votes, but I do expect that most of them will be that way. And, and so Rick, from the point of view of this leap of um, faith that you're basically asking me to do, uh, as I said earlier, uh, it's creative, um, it's interesting. Um, I certainly think it has an interesting potential um, if we can all walk into it with that kind of commitment to try to achieve a uh, four to zero vote. Um, I would be willing to do that. Um, that's what I'm gonna be looking to do. Um, I hope that Lois and Gail and Tina will join me in that effort and that this is something, in fact, that I'm hopeful we get some uh, folks applying for this that are um, that can bring new expertise, new experiences to the board, new faces, new blood um, that will continue to advance this district in the path that it needs to go. Um, I want, you know, you, you, you've done a lot of work in this, obviously, you've thought a lot about it. And uh, like I say, I'm, I'm sorry to see you go, um, but I think this, this is a real indication of, of the kind of leadership that you've brought to the district. And I hope that you won't go too far uh, when it comes time to have those conversations um, and sort of remind all of us that you brought this forward with the expectation that everybody would work towards getting a consensus um, uh, for who the new board member should be so that that person would um, basically reflect the kind of issues that were important, not only this last election, but the one before it as well. So please do um, plan on attending those, those meetings. That would be very helpful, I think. And Lois, if, if I could, there's uh, there a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, do you, you want to not go to it right now, or uh, no? I I, I I I wanted to address Bob's uh, point there, but I don't want to go and lose this motion here. I want to keep we, this thing going as correct. quickly. You can, once motions are made, we can always have a conversation about them. There's nothing okay. cutting off. Yeah. All right. So be a point of me, order, by the way. Yeah. So let me just, if I may, Lois, uh, continue uh, uh, with some of Bob's questions here that I can hopefully answer. Is uh, 
Yes, Bob, I have uh, seen you in action in the board of directors and the, on the board and on committees. And I uh, applaud your commitment to this community and this water district. You have worked uh, tirelessly. And uh, yes, uh, this does require a little bit, well, it requires a leap of faith and it is potentially filled with some risk here. Um, but um, I'm hoping, and that, that's me, I'm hoping the, for the best here. So um, I'm glad to hear that you're willing to do this. And I am around, I'm not leaving any place. I don't have a home in Texas or Nevada or any place else. I just have a home here. Um, so I will uh, make sure that what I've heard here tonight gets repeated and stuck to uh, later on in any uh, choice the board has to make about a replacement. Okay, um, thank you, Moran. And I appreciate your service to this board. And I'm going to ask Holly to call the question. All right, um, for the first motion to rescind the previous um, decision by the board, President Henry. Yes. Director Ferris. Hi, yeah. let me just jump in here. Um, I think the two motions were joined. Oh, they are? Okay. Yeah, so it's one motion with a couple of components. Okay, one motion. So if you could, do you agree with that, Director Moran? That was your motion. Or did you mean for this to be called separately? I was taking your suggestion that they be done separately. Oh, okay, I apologize for that. Then. Um, so you're calling the motion to reconsider and rescind? Yes, and okay. to be followed by the next motion. Okay, thank you, I'll, sorry for yeah. that. Yeah. Director Falls. Sorry, did we already get uh, Director Ferris's vote? Yes, he said yes. Uh, yes. Director Moran. Yes. On the second motion to appoint <laughs> Holly, could you just uh, state for the record what the vote was? Because I couldn't hear everybody. I, I all in favor. I never got the vote. Yes, you voted first. I did? Yes. Yeah. All right. Whatever. Would you like me to call it again? No, it's fine. It's fine. Holly, could you just uh, let everyone know what you recorded as the vote? that it's clear on the record? All voted in favor. Everyone said yes. Thank you. For the second motion to uh, appoint President Henry. Yes. Director Ferris. Yes. Director False. Yes. Director Moran. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you all. That, that's hard work. Thank you. That's the hardest, that's the hardest I've worked in a while. Okay. Yeah. Council, does that conclude this item? Or is there additions to this item? That sounds like we're done. It it is yeah. it, I think. Uh, I believe that um is everything that, that needs to be off. done under this item tonight. Okay, thank you. Okay. So um vote to adjourn. Everybody in favor of adjourning. <laughs> I I see a raised hand there. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. Nice. Yes, uh, 7.34, 7.34 is the time. Okay, thank you, Holly.